What I've been working on is actually, um, I've, I've run into a few gentlemen that have some very unusual and very, very what I think are believable models of the electron. And I, what I found is that their models actually go very well with some of the theories that I had presented in the past about four years ago, or actually about three years ago. And uh, it, they're, what they're showing independently supports what I had tried to, what I had tried to validate about three years ago. But they're just taking it to the next level of actually you know, using numbers and equations to, to demonstrate that. Now, you, you mentioned something earlier about this, about the electron being superluminal on part of its orbit, right? That's or, right. There's a gentleman here by the name of Richard Gauthier, and what he's done is uh, put, put together a quantum model of both the photon and the electron. And uh, this quantum-like particle traces out a closed path within itself to make up what we see as the electron. But this particle travels in a trajectory such that 57% of the time it's superluminal and the other 43% of the time it's subluminal. And the way that this path is oriented is like a double helix. And the way that that ties in with the research that I had done before was just how space time is, how we can use space time as a particular reference and what charge means and what magnetism means and how that can be easily defined and represented. And what his model has shown is that uh, so far that holds true. <laughs> That's holding true some of the perceptions that I've had before. Well, now, as you flesh this model out, does it make any predictions for what, what you might be able to use it for in terms of applications? Or? Uh, well, he's, he's actually presenting in the communication session. Um, and what this actually can do is if, you can, if we can show that matter, not so much just the electron, but matter, and, you know, electron, proton, neutron, and all the other particles have a superluminal, superluminal, superluminal characteristic to them then we might be able to exploit that in some way to mm -hmm. either use it for communication, data transmission, or even changing the state of matter to exist in a different type of realm where it's, you know, superluminal is the norm. So like one of the immediate benefits might be even for a conventional NASA probe, uh, they would be able to communicate with it instantly without having to worry about you know, the speed of light for transmissions. Yeah, exactly. And then later on, if they, can do, if they can determine how to do that, they might be able to, as I said, transform matter itself into a different form of matter where the part of basic particle design is the same, but the laws are different. Yeah. And yeah. then that would take it basically into another space, which is what I was talking, which is what I've been presenting about for many years. And then from there on, superluminal is the norm, and so you can travel at the speed of light without violating any causality rules. And so forth. Well, I, now in terms of the, the superluminal component of it, um, I, I guess I should start out by asking what part, because as I understand it, you know, the, the normal model has this dumbbell-shaped orbital, or at least for some electrons, mm -hmm. where, where that's your probability zone for your electron. What, what part of that would be the superluminal part? Well, actually, it's not the electron itself that he's talking about. It's what, or I'm sorry, it's not the electron as we observe it, which is like this, you know, this cloud of energy around an atom. It's what's actually making up that cloud, what's making up the electron, and how this point-like particle traces a path within itself to make what we see as an electron. And then that is what we observe as you know being part of the Heisenberg principle of what we don't know where it is or what it looks like that sort of thing. But it's this point-like particle that's almost photon-like in nature. It's like a quantum particle that makes up the electron. And if he can show that it makes up the electron, which is a fundamental particle, then that same application can be applied to the other quarks and so forth that make up a proton, where there's three of them interacting. And then if he can show that, you know, then who knows what else he can show? Well, well now. I, I think that there's the, a popular notion that if you can travel faster than light, um, you might be able to travel backwards in time, maybe for communications in this case. But th do you think that would hold true, or is, or is that more of a kind of just a conventional mythology, I guess? That's, uh, I think, more part of the conventional mythology and what most people do think, um, because general relativity, or actually special relativity, does say that. When you get close to the speed of light, things change very dramatically, mass, length, time, etc. And when you work the math out, you get negative numbers, which says, oh, you must be going backward in time. Well, if you take certain characteristics of the fun, certain characteristics of those equations, and you start out with them being either being imaginary or negative in nature as their norm, then you don't have those effects. They're, again, positive. So you could, see, at the same time, travel faster than the speed of light and have relativity work backwards, where the faster you go, the more time will still proceed forward in either space. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're going slower than light, time proceeds forward. If we try to go faster than light in our space, 
where the laws say that you can't, then you know, obviously you would think you would go backwards in time. Sure. But sure. if you go into the superluminal space, which is the realm where everything going faster than the speed of light is perfectly normal, then when you go faster than the light, everything proceeds forward again. Mm, okay. If you were to try to go slower than light in that space, things would go backwards. So. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, so okay. basically you have, everything's kind of coming to an asymptote right at the speed of light. Yeah, and yeah. So, the effects are backwards. And that's sort of the, the, the area where I've been focusing on for about 10 years is using this different way of looking at the very simplistic algebra of the special and general relativity to say, well, maybe there's, th maybe there's a different way of looking at these answers, saying that, it, you know, that there might be these three independent spaces that are all coexisting in one, one particular location. Well, do, do you think that the super, superluminality may explain quantum effects? Absolutely. Where you know, it disappears one place and reappears at another. Absolutely, and that's what's so um, appealing about uh, Mr. Gauthier's electron model, is he's just now touching on all that, saying that because matter, you know, specifically the electron that he's looked at, has this superluminal characteristic to it, it might explain or lend a hand in explaining some things like, you know, entanglement or, you know, quantum tunneling or, you know, you know particles just appearing out of nowhere and then disappearing. And so that's uh, that's all being worked on right now. But go ahead. Oh well, you know, one of the other ideas might also be that it could be jumping brains, which I think is something that Eric Davis had talked about as a potential propulsion mechanism. Yeah, that's year. right. And the way that the brain, at least my take on the whole brain issue, is that there's only basically one brain, but two different spaces, one on each side of the brain. And so you see the gravitational effects from each space through the brain, but you don't directly observe the brain itself. You know, the, or I'm, I should say the other side of the brain. So we can see what's going on actually on the brain, which, which is what we see as space-time, but we can't see through it into this other realm. And you know, I know there's a, there's a lot of theories out there about multi-brain interactions and you know, brains popping and creating their own universes and intersecting and creating some sort of uh, you know, some sort of event there. And um, uh, yeah, the uh, like what you just mentioned about the brains where you travel from one brain to another, etc. So those are all. You know, those are all based, I think, mainly on string theory and brain theory, and it's all kind of tied in together. But even early on, the work I was trying to show was that there's basically one brain, and it seems that that's much easier to understand, <laughs> but yet you get the same benefits of having these multi multiple brains. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's just, in my mind, nature is too simple to be that complicated for as, as much as we try to read into some of these, uh, some of these uh, equations and theories. Well, I, I think it's an excellent point because quantum mechanics itself is challenging and then adding brain theory on top of that, you know, it, it really adds so many other components to it that the complexity just gets out of control. Absolutely. And I mean, no matter how you think about it from equations or from, uh, from actual, you know, from just the, the thought process going behind it, you know, nature prefers some level of simplicity. And what I've tried to show in some of the work I've done was that, you know, here's a very simple graphical visual model of what's going on with how to explain magnetism, how to explain electric fields, and how to interact the two, and how to interact dark matter and dark energy and zero point fields, and it all comes together as one. And so taking, you know, taking things that we see in astro astrophysics and cosmology, and taking things that we see at the complete opposite end of the magnitudes down at the quantum level and merging them together, is what I think people are trying to are starting to realize now is that this is all tied into the same thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. when we start taking pictures of you know the universe in general, and we see dark matter distributions and galaxy distributions and how galaxies are made, we may re we may see that at the quantum level if we look deep enough, we may see the exact same type of structure because yeah. it's all made of the same stuff.